desperate and angry, Akwamwa cursed her by me, the man who had ruined her life. This will find you wherever you are. And I swear by the gods, you will die in pain and mortal with tears. She was filled with so much anger and sadness. Once upon a time, in a small but wonderful beautiful African village, there lived a lovely maiden named Akwanwa. She was so lovely that even the most beautiful people in the village called her beautiful. Akwanwa came from a very respected family in the village. Her father Mazi Kanayo was a wise advisor to the king and everyone in the village admired him for his wisdom. People said he had the wisdom of the elders which made him very special. Akwanwa was Mazika Nayo's only daughter and child, and her parents raised her with lots of love and care. She was very humble and also a joyful child, always smiling and eager to make new friends. She had a heart full of kindness and laughter, and everyone in the village adored her. The villagers loved Akwanwa so much that whenever she walked through the village, People would greet her with warm smiles and friendly waves. Children would run up to her, wanting to play and be around her because she was so friendly and fun to be with. Akwanwa's laughter was like music that made everyone happy. Many young men in the village admired Akwanwa and wished to marry her because she was not only beautiful but also kind and cheerful. Her gentle nature and bright smile made her the perfect maiden in the eyes of the villagers. Every day, young men would think of ways to impress her and win her heart. But Akwanwa was not only known for her beauty and kindness, she was also very wise, just like her father. As Akwanwa grew, her beauty and wisdom grew too, making her even more beloved by everyone. The village knew that whoever Akwanwa chose to marry would be a very lucky person and they all hoped for her happiness. Akwanwa fell in love with a young fisherman from a nearby village. His name was Obioma and he was very handsome. But more than his looks, he knew how to pamper Akwanwa and make her laugh with his funny jokes. Obiyama had a special way of making Akwanwa feel happy and loved. Her parents liked him a lot too, because he was very hardworking and respectful. He always showed kindness and respect to everyone, which made him well liked. The young men in Akwanwa's village were disappointed when they found out that she had chosen Obiyama as her lover. They admired her beauty and hoped to win her heart. But he had to accept her decision, even though Akwanwa was now with Obiyama. They still admired her from afar, respecting her choice. Obiyama and Akwanwa started dreaming about their future together. They made beautiful plans, thinking about the home they would build and the family they would have. As their love grew stronger, Obiyama decided to ask Akwanwa to marry him. He loved her so much and couldn't wait to have her as his wife. When Obiyama proposed, Akwan was filled with joy. She couldn't wait to share the exciting news with her friends. When she told them, her friends were so happy for her. You are so lucky, they said. Obiyama is the most handsome man in Akweze village and you too will be the envy of everyone. Her friends were right. Obioma, the most handsome man in Akbeze, and Akwanwa, the most beautiful maiden in Ndiora, were a perfect match. It was a very happy moment for everyone. They all danced and celebrated with Akwanwa, sharing in her joy. Akwanwa's parents were also very happy about the engagement. Her mother, with a smile on her face, said, I see the way he looks at you. All the big fish he catches are always for you. 
that is how you know a man who will take good care of his wife. He reminds me so much of your father when he was younger and I wish you both well. Akwama felt so happy and blessed. The date of their marriage was set and it was just a few months away. The young lovers could hardly wait to be together forever. They would sit under the tree every evening, counting the days with excitement, dreaming about their happy future together. One evening, as the sun was setting and the sky was painted with shades of orange and pink, Akwama was returning from the forest. She had gone there to fetch some firewood because they had run out of wood and she needed to prepare dinner for her family. The path through the forest was quiet and lonely, and Akwama walked quickly, wanting to get home as fast as she could. She knew the forest could be dangerous at night, and she didn't want to take any chances. As she hurried along the path, she suddenly heard the rustling of leaves behind her. At first, she thought it might be a small animal searching for food. She tried to reassure herself that it was nothing to worry about, but then she heard footsteps. Her heart began to raise. Who could it be, she wondered. She turned around slowly and her heart almost stopped when she saw who it was. Standing behind her was Obainu, the village terrorist. Obainu was known for being a very bad man. He had done many terrible things and the villagers had been looking for him for a long time. Since he left the village, he had been a kind of peace but now he was back and Akuma felt a wave of fear wash over her. She wondered what he was going to do with her. Was he going to kill her? Obainu was a very heartless man and Akuma felt a shield run down her spine. Akuma, he called her name laughing in a wicked way that made her blood run cold. Your beauty makes me want to go crazy whenever I see you. His eyes had an intimidating look and Akwama could feel her whole body shaking. Please, don't hurt me, Akwama pleaded, her voice trembling with fear. She could barely stand as her legs felt like jelly. Obainu looked at her and smiled a scary smile. Why would I hurt an angel like you? He said, coming closer to her. His words were sweet, but his eyes were filled with menace. He reached out and took the bundle of firewood she was carrying away from her hand and held her tightly. Please, Akwama pleaded again, tears welling up in her eyes. She didn't know what he was planning to do, and she felt utterly helpless. Obaino's grip on her was strong and she could feel her breath on her face. Obaino looked at her for a moment and then, to her surprise, he let out a laugh. You are too precious to harm Akuma, he said. But his words did not comfort her. She knew that a man as dangerous as Obaino could not be trusted. Akuma's mind raised as she tried to think of a way to escape. She knew she had to stay calm and think clearly. She looked around, hoping to see someone who could help her, but the path was deserted. The only sound were the rustling leaves and the distant shaping of birds. Please, let me go, she said again, her voice barely above a whisper. I need to get home to my family. Obino's eyes narrowed, and for a moment, Akwama thought he might let her go. But then, he shook his head. Not so fast, he said. I've been looking for you for a long time, Akwamwa. But aren't the gods so kind? His face changed and his eyes blazed with a terrifying fire. Akwamwa could sense the danger coming. Swiftly, Obaino placed a hand over her mouth, muffling her cries and dragged her deeper into the forest. Despite her desperate struggles to break free, he was far too powerful. In the depths of the forest, her cries rang throughout the forest as he brutally raped her. When he was done, he let out a wicked laugh, a sound that sent chills down Akwama's spine. And then he disappeared into the forest once again, 
leaving her alone and broken. Akwama was in an unbearable pain, both physically and emotionally. She couldn't believe what had just happened to her. With a weak voice, she screamed, hoping someone would hear and come to her aid. But no one was around. She was very weak and soon her strength gave out and she passed out lying helplessly on the forest floor. Her mother returned from the market in the evening, expecting to find Akwanwa at home, but she was not there. I have warned Akwanwa to stop staying out late with Obioma, she muttered angrily. Soon, they will get married and can spend all the time they want together. But as the sky darkened and night approached, her anger turned to worry. Akwanwa had never stayed out this late before. When Mazi Kanayo returned home, his wife, panicking, told him that Akwama was missing. Alarmed, Mazi Kanayo grabbed a lamp and together they began searching for her throughout the village. They went from house to house asking if anyone had seen their beloved daughter. When they reached her best friend Ngozi's house, Ngozi was surprised that Akwanwa had not returned home. The last time I saw her, Ngozi said, she came here asking me to follow her to the Ekem forest to fetch firewood, but I was cooking so I couldn't go with her. She's supposed to have returned by now. Akwanwa's mother Ilo began to cry, her heart filled with dread. She is my only child, she wailed. What have I done to deserve this? Why would Akwanwa go to the forest alone? Where is my daughter? Tears streamed down her face uncontrollably as her fear for Akwanwa's safety grew. The villagers quickly organized a search party with lamps in their hands. They ventured into the Ekem forest, calling out Akwanwa's name and searching every corner. The forest was dark and filled with eerie sounds, but they pressed on, driven by hope of finding Akwanwa safe. As they wandered deep into the forest, they called her name louder and louder, their voices echoing through the trees. They searched tirelessly, their hearts heavy with worry. The forest seemed endless and every rustle of leaves or crack of a twig made them jump, hoping it was Akwanwa. But as the hours passed, there was still no sign of her. The villagers, though exhausted, refused to give up. They knew they had to find Akwanwa and bring her back to her family. As they continued their search, Mazi, Kanayo, and Ilo clung to each other, praying for their daughter's safety. The night felt colder and darker than usual, but the villagers' determination kept the search going. Everyone hoped and prayed that Akwama would be found soon, safe and sound. Suddenly, there was a loud shout in the forest. Hey, I found her! I found her! The villagers quickly ran towards the voice. There on the ground, they saw Akwama weak, but still breathing. Her clothes were stained and torn. It was clear she had been through something terrible. One of the young men carefully lifted her up. It looks like she was raped, he said. We need to get her to Nweke, the herbalist, right away, he said urgently. They hurried to Nweke's hut, carrying Akwanwa as fast as they could. Her parents followed closely behind, their faces filled with worry and hope. When they arrived in Nweke's hut, Nweke's wife took one look at Akwanwa and quickly led them inside. She began to clean Akwanwa gently, her face sad and serious. Yes, she was raped, she confirmed. Nweke got to work immediately. He mixed some special herbs and made a warm concussion. His wife massaged Akwanwa's body with hot water, speaking to her in calming tones. She will be fine, he reassured her worried parents. Thank God she was found in time. Akwanwa's parents stayed by her side, holding her hands and whispering words of love. They watched as Nweke and his wife cared for their daughter with great skill and tenderness. The villagers gathered outside the hut, hoping and praying for Akwanwa's recovery. Hours went by and slowly, by morning, Akwanwa began to show signs of improvement. Her breathing became steady and some color returned to her cheeks. Nweke's wife 
brought her a warm drink, helping her to sip it slowly. You are a strong girl, she whispered to Akwanwa. You will get through this. Akwanwa's parents felt a glimmer of hope as they saw her responding to treatment. Mweke reassured them. She needs rest and time to heal, but she will recover. The villagers, hearing this news, felt a sense of relief. They had all been worried about Akwanwa and now there was a ray of hope. Still, Akwanwa had not said a word. She was too grieved to speak. Her fiancé, Obioma, heard what had happened and made her fish pepper soup with some herbs. The love the villagers showed her was so heartwarming, even though she was still haunted by the trauma of what had just happened to her. She was soon allowed to go home when she had gotten better. She revealed to her parents in tears what had happened to her. She told them how Obaino had raped her in the forest. The pain was still fresh in her heart and her parents consoled her, promising to get justice. But after combing the whole forest, no one saw Obaino. He had disappeared again. For weeks, Akwanwa remained indoors. She was in pain and wasn't ready to move on. Her parents encouraged her. Obiyama spoke to her, but she said she needed more time. But as the weeks passed, she discovered she was pregnant. That day was the worst day of her life. As she cried bitterly, so many thoughts raced through her mind. She was going to have a child for a man who had brought nothing but pain to the entire village. She couldn't bear to be the one to have this evil child. To make matters worse, Obioma called off the marriage as soon as he heard that Akwanwa was pregnant. I can't live with a child of that monster under my roof, he said. All pleas fell on deaf ears as his parents had also warned him not to continue with the marriage. Akwama felt like her world was falling apart. She was overwhelmed with pain and sorrow. She had not yet recovered from the trauma of the attack and now she had to deal with the shock of being pregnant. And on top of that, Obioma, the one person she thought she could rely on, had abandoned her. Her heart felt shattered. Desperate and angry, Akwanwa cursed Obainu, the man who had ruined her life. Death will find you wherever you are. And I swear by the gods, you will die in pain, she muttered through tears. She was filled with so much anger and sadness that she even wished her unborn baby would die inside her, not wanting to bring in to the world such misery. A few months later, Akwanwa went into labor and gave birth to a bouncing baby boy. But instead of feeling joy, she felt broken. She couldn't even bring herself to look at her baby. Her mother held the little boy close, playing with him and trying to bring some share. But Akwanwa turned her face away, tears streaming down her cheeks. Back at home, Akwanwa refused to touch her baby. She even refused to breastfeed him. Please, my daughter, her mother pleaded, breastfeed your child. It's not his fault that he came into this life this way. Then, whose fault is it, mama? Whose fault? Tell me, Akwanwa cried out. This child ruined my life. He destroyed all the beautiful things happening around me. Oh! How I wish he had died in my womb. God forbid, Akwanwa, do not say that. This baby is innocent. Please, who knows if this child would be the one to wipe your tears tomorrow, her mother said, trying to console her. But Akwanwa couldn't bring herself to care for the baby. She hated him with a deep passion. Her mother, seeing how Akwanwa refused to give him any attention, took over and raised him herself. She named the baby Dozier and loved him like her own. As Dozier began to grow, he looked exactly like his father. There was no mistaking it. 
all the features of Obaino were clearly evident in Dozier, and anyone could tell that he was Obaino's child. One day, Dozier was sitting in front of the hut playing when Akwama returned from the market. She had never looked at his face since he was born, but that day she decided to look at him for the first time, really seeing him, and then she screamed. Her mother ran out of the house worried. What is it? she asked. It's Dozier, she said, pointing at him. Look at his face, mama. I see him. His eyes, his nose, his mouth. Mama, why have the gods chosen to punish me all my life? Akwama cried. Her mother held her and repeated the same words she always said. It's not his fault that he was born this way. Akwama's hatred for Dozier only grew. She couldn't accept him and no matter what he did, it was never good enough. She would hit him for the slightest things and always called him an evil child. Her parents would always caution her, but she paid attention to no one. Dozier would cry and cry, not understanding why his mother hated him so much. He yearned for her love and approval, but it seemed like nothing he did could change her mind. The pain of rejection stayed with him, making his young heart heavy with sadness. Despite the love from his grandparents, the absence of his mother's affection left a deep wound in his spirit. One evening, Dozi returned from the river crying. His mother and grandma were in the kitchen making dinner when he walked in. What is it, my child? His grandmother asked, her voice filled with concern. Mama, I was fetching water from the stream when Nonso came and pushed me, Dozier said, tears streaming down his face. I refused to fight back, but then he started hitting me, unable to bear it anymore. I fought him back, and then the other boys ganged up against me and started hitting me, calling me the son of a criminal. They said my father is a notorious thief and murderer. His voice was filled with pain and hurt. I will have to see their parents, Ilo said angrily. Why would they call my son a criminal? Isn't he a criminal? Akwama interjected harshly. The son of a criminal is a criminal. The village children were right. He is going to end up like his father, she screamed, her words like daggers. Tears rolled down Dozier's cheeks as he listened to his mother. He ran into the house and sat there crying. Life was unbearable for Dozi and every day felt like a nightmare. His grandma, who always stood by him, got sick, and his days turned into a living hell as his mother didn't spare him any cruelty. Dozi was a broken child. You hardly ever saw him happy. He was always sad and alone. Everyone hated him because he was a constant reminder of his father who had caused pain to many families in the village. On the fateful day, his grandmother died. Dozier cried and refused to be consoled. He rolled on the floor, sobbing like a baby. He knew that the only person who had ever shown him love was gone. He wondered what would happen to him now. The villagers watched him with pity in their eyes. A few months after Ilo's burial, Akwama married a rich trader who lived in the city. She couldn't leave Dozier, who was 12 years old, with her father, so she took him along. Things didn't get any better for Dozier. Rather, they only grew worse. There was no one to defend him in any way. The only time Dozier had peace, was when he was in school, which he rarely attended. He was subjected to all kinds of emotional torture, treated like a slave, and Akwama never acknowledged him as her son. Akwama had three children with her new husband, and Dozier became their servant, working tirelessly without appreciation and being punished for the slightest mistake. Akwama pampered her other children, 
but Dozier endured her cruelty every single day of his life. Tears were his constant companion, and when he couldn't bear it anymore, he ran away. He had no destination in mind but just needed to escape, even if it meant death taking him away. He slept in an unfinished building for days without any food. When he couldn't bear the hunger anymore, he decided he needed to find a small job to sustain himself. One morning, as he was walking through the streets, he saw a signpost that read Houseboy Wanted. With a glimmer of hope, he knocked at the gate and was greeted by the security man. After explaining what he wanted, he was introduced to the employer, a very kind and beautiful woman with two children. She was a school teacher and her husband was a doctor in the city. Doze shared his heartbreaking story with them. And after he assured them he could handle the job, they offered him the position. Meanwhile, Akuma didn't even bother to search for her son. She wished he would die wherever he was and never come back again. It was good radiance to bad rubbish. Dozier found peace with this wonderful couple who became his new masters. He was a very good boy, respectful and dedicated. He took care of the couple's children as though they were his own siblings. His masters grew to love him very much and treated him like their own child. After finishing his daily chores, Dozier would sit down and read any book he could find. He loved learning and dreamed of being as educated as his masters. One day, Mr. Chude, the husband, returned from work and saw Dozier reading a newspaper. He sat beside him and asked, Tell me, Dozier, I always see you reading. What do you understand from what you are reading now? Excited to share his thoughts, Dozier began to explain with great clarity and boldness. Mr. Shude was amazed by his intelligence. You are a genius, he exclaimed. Because you've been such a great help to us, henceforth you will be a son and no longer a servant. We shall send you to school. Dozier was overjoyed. He thanked his masters with tears in his eyes. The shoe days kept their promise and sent him to school, where Dozier excelled remarkably. He did so well that he was awarded a scholarship by the state government to study abroad. Years later, Akwanwa's children grew up, but because she didn't raise them properly and was consumed by her hatred and bitterness for Dozier, they became a nuisance. It was always from one problem to the other. Her two sons turned into notorious criminals, and her only daughter refused to do anything productive with her life. All she did was steal from her parents and jump from one sugar daddy to the other. These children brought nothing but pain and shame to Akwamwa. They were constantly in and out of the police station. Akwamwa was always in tears, wondering why life had been so unfair to her. She started to think, probably she was being punished for something. She remembered Dozier and all the terrible things she had done to him. She realized she had destroyed him out of her own pain and wished she could see him again, even to just apologize, but she doubted if he was still alive. Her mother had warned her about her actions, but she didn't listen. Her husband, unable to bear the shame his children constantly brought upon the family, sold off everything he had and moved to a faraway city, leaving them with nothing but the house. Akwamwa became very sick and was at the point of death. Her children were nowhere to be found. They abandoned her, leaving her to die slowly and alone. She lay on the bed in pain and full of regrets. One afternoon, a friend of Akwanwa came to visit her and found her lying helplessly on her bed. Alarmed, 
She quickly raised the alarm and Akwama was rushed to the hospital. The doctors ran a test on her and discovered that her blood pressure was very high and she was at the high risk of losing her life. They wouldn't begin treatment until a deposit was paid. Her children were unreachable and her husband wouldn't respond. She was left alone. All police fell on deaf ears. From his office, Doze could see the commotion going on and decided to step in to see how he could help. But when he reached the ward, he was shocked to see his mother fighting for her life. She was unconscious, but he recognized her immediately, despite the toll age had taken on her. Tears welled up in his eyes. He ordered the staff to commence her treatment immediately. Despite the pain she had caused him, she was still his mother and he couldn't watch her die. Everyone was confused about what was happening, but as the director, Dozier's orders were followed without question. Dozier had become a highly skilled and respected medical doctor. He was one of the best in the country and had recently been appointed as a director of a very large hospital in the city. He was doing exceptionally well and his parents and colleagues were proud of him. One morning, Jose decided to check on his mother to see how she was doing. She had been in coma for weeks and he had heard she regained consciousness. Deep down, he longed to see her, but had been fighting the urge. She had treated him badly, but somehow, he still loved her as his mother. He couldn't get over the pain he had seen on her face the day she was brought in, and he wondered what had happened to her rich husband and her beautiful children. It hurt him badly, but he had to let go so he could be free. His foster parents had told him to forgive his mother so he could have a good life. When we let go of our pains, they said to him, we open ourselves to new possibilities. As he stepped into the ward, he was surprised to find her sitting up in the bed and being fed by a nurse. Akwama felt like she was in a dream. She blinked several times to be sure she wasn't imagining things. Right before her stood a younger version of Obaimu, yet with a kinder demeanor. She began to shiver, and the nurses held her. Dozier, she finally managed to say in tears. Dozier looked at his mother and couldn't help but feel sorry for her. He could see she was going through a lot of pain. He saw the fear and recognition in her eyes and knew there was an unfinished story. He didn't know the full story surrounding his birth. The only thing he knew was that she had always called his father a criminal and told him that he would end up like his father. Though she had almost destroyed him, he was grateful for the man he had become. He moved closer and held her hands. Mother, he called softly. She held him tightly, tears streaming down her face. I'm so sorry, my son. I'm so sorry. I cannot die in peace. I surely deserve to be punished. I have longed for this day to come so that I can tell you how sorry I am even though it can't make up for all the things I've done to you. Please forgive me. She cried as she shared her story with him. That time, I felt like my life had been taken away from me. I lost myself and then I lost everything. It was just too much for me and I took out my frustrations on you. I was such a fool. But now I have learned my lesson. 
Dozier now understood her pain. They both cried together, their hearts finally finding peace as they reunited. I'm going to do my best to take care of you and ensure you get better, he assured her. I won't let you die. All Akwamwa could do was cry. The son she had despised and wished death upon turned out to be the one who saved her life and took care of her in her old age. He was nothing like his father and had a heart full of love and compassion. She couldn't be grateful enough. As for her other children, the two boys were killed due to their criminal activities and the girl continued her wayward lifestyle, bringing nothing but pain and shame. Akwama often wondered what would have become of her if not for Dozier. He made her very happy throughout her old age and she learned a very important lesson about forgiveness, love and the true meaning of family. Hey besties, thank you for watching this amazing story and I hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed making it. I would like you to share your lessons in the comment section. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you are yet to subscribe to this channel and turn on your notification bell so that you get notified whenever we post new stories. Thank you so much for all your love and support. I do not take even a single one of it for granted. Right now, I'll have to go and see you in our next story. Bye!